What the hell happened with the UK's electronic passport e-gate system last week? Distributed systems are always complicated things. There are just so many things that can go wrong. But not many people seem to pay enough attention to this rather serious problem. And instead, they design systems that only work as long as everything everywhere is working perfectly. This is a huge mistake, and we can do an awful lot better than that if we design appropriately. So in this episode, I want to use the recent failure of the passport control systems in the UK as an example of not designing with failure in mind, and how we could and should do a better job of designing systems like this. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. At the end of last week in the UK, it was big news that all of the electronic passport checking systems for all UK airports stopped working, creating significant disruption and leaving tens of thousands of people queuing for hours to get through the now manual passport control process put in place as an emergency response to the failure of the e-gate system. Some elderly people were even passed out and needed assistance because of the stress of standing in hot, confined conditions for so long without proper access to water and toilets. Not the ideal way to end your holiday or business trip. The electronic passport checking is an important part of speeding the flow of people through border checks. And the devices that let you into the country are called e-gates. They scan the biometric data in your passport and then they scan your face to verify that you are who you say you are. Then they check that you aren't on some blacklist of people who aren't allowed into the country. The details of what went wrong with the eGate system have not yet been published, but I have an idea what went wrong. Some media have already reported that this outage was caused by a Wi-Fi failure in the Home Office, who are responsible for border security in the UK and run the eGate system. This outage was triggered when the Home Office did some work on a software update. I believe that the system that we're updating wasn't directly linked to the eGate system. So this is a fairly good example of incidental coupling that we discussed recently. The Wi-Fi failure was reported as happening because it was used to update another system. This update exceeded the data limits in the contract and so BT, who provided the Wi-Fi service, shut the Wi-Fi down. Unfortunately, this Wi-Fi was also used as the route between the, all of the e-gates in the country and the database of terror suspects and other people who should be denied entry, maintained by the Home Office. Before we go into this single point of failure that was responsible for the e-gate failure, I'll talk about why distributed systems are quite so complex and why how they fail is much more complicated than for other types of systems. At the end, I'll explain in a bit more detail what the single point of failure for the eGate debacle was, and several ways to design to avoid it, and I'll tell you which one solution I would have chosen and why. But before we get any further into the video, let me thank our sponsors. We are extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Transfic, and Semaphore. All of these companies offer products and services that are extremely well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering in general, click on the links in the description below to check them out. This failure originally piqued my interest before I'd heard reports of the Wi-Fi failure. How on earth could a distributed system fail in unison like this? This is not the first failure of this system either. It's had several previous reported large-scale failures. This clearly points to a specific problem in my mind. Initial reports speculated wrongly that this might have been the result of a cyber attack. But no, this was a technical failure, and more importantly for our purposes, I'd argue that this was a failure of design. John Atkinson, Director of Solutions Engineering at Riverbed Technology, was quoted as saying, when technology works as it should, it's the route to a more efficient operations and a great digital experience for employees and customers. When it doesn't, the effects can be painful for all. Sorry, John, but I disagree. He goes on to say, Operating with such complex IT estates is now too difficult and stressful for IT teams to keep operations running smoothly, without, that is, additional tools with networks' intense interconnectedness. Teams need observability so that they can better understand topology and see when a seemingly insignificant issue could lead to a full-blown outage. 
Sorry, John, but I still disagree. I'll explain where I think John is mistaken later in the video. My point is that bad stuff can certainly always happen. And certainly bad stuff caused by seemingly insignificant issues can happen too. But in distributed systems, bad things will always happen at some point. So the trick in systems like these is to design things so that they don't assume perfection everywhere else. Instead, we need to design for resilience, particularly for important safety critical systems like these e-gates. Resilience is vital for systems like these. Another aspect to maintaining our systems in a more robust state is to maintain our ability to change them. Check out our recent how-to guide on evolutionary architecture as one part of the strategy to achieve that. I was once working with a team in a bank in Australia. They'd asked me to discuss the topic of building more resilient systems with them. I hadn't met any of the people in the room before, so we all sat down with our cups of coffee, feeling a bit lost about where to begin. So I thought that I'd start by saying something obvious to get the conversation going. So I said, of course, it's obvious that the key to resilient systems is to assume that everything can fail at any time and that it probably will. There was stunned silence in the room. We thought the job was to stop anything from failing. No, that's not what resilient systems are really about. So the conversation really got going at that point. Let's just think about that for a moment and let's start with what makes distributed systems quite so complicated. Fundamentally, there are simply more things in the middle of the interaction between different parts of a system that can go wrong in a distributed system. Here's one way of thinking about that from an earlier video. As soon as you distribute processing and information, you add a huge amount of new ways for things to go wrong. Here's an example. If I have a couple of programs that talk across a network, how many ways can this conversation go wrong? Well, there may be a bug in application one that means it fails before it's able to talk to application two. App one may not be able to establish a connection to the network and so can't send its messages. The network may fail while the information from app one is en route and so never arrives at app two. App two may not have been able to connect to the network. App2 may be too busy to process the call when it arrives. App2 may not be able to understand the message from App1. And then there may be a bug in App2. And then all of these possible failures can happen in reverse when App2 tries to send a response back to App1. Nearly all of these potential points of failure are outside of our direct control. And the causes of these failures go from anything from a programming error to a meteor strike on your data center. Fortunately, it wasn't quite that bad for the e-gate failure, but it was something almost as random. So what can we do? Well, an important part of the job of any engineer, but certainly a software engineer, is to imagine how our system might go wrong, and then to come up with ways to either eliminate or at least mitigate the costs of the failure with how we design the system. There are a surprisingly small number of e-gates at the UK airports, actually, only about 275 according to the news media. But even so, beyond the unlikeliest of random chance, there's only one way that all 275 can fail at the same time, which is the cause of my first disagreement with John Atkinson. When he talks about the effects being painful when the technology doesn't work, well, sure, that may be the case where systems were designed to assume perfection in all aspects, perfect specification, perfect implementation, perfect execution, perfect infrastructure, and so on. But important systems shouldn't really be designed like that. It's naive and unnecessarily risky. We can never eliminate errors completely. And because distributed systems have so many extra ways to go wrong, they will fail more often and are often harder to diagnose when they do. But in this case, it was pretty obvious that the e-gate system had a common point of failure somewhere. Because if you stop that part of the system from working, then the rest of the system can't continue doing useful work. When I heard about this failure, I guessed that it was most likely about the act of looking up who's not allowed in. This is an obvious candidate because it's about shared data. And so a simple solution is a simple common point of contact. I'm not saying all of this to boast, but to point out that it should have been obvious that for this kind of system, this would be a potential point of failure. So building the system without any mitigation or contingency was an extremely risky design choice, 
which meant that it was pretty much inevitable that this kind of incident would happen one day, even if we couldn't predict the precise root cause. I'll show you how to avoid that in just a moment. So what would a better distributed design look like? Well, there are several strategies that we could and maybe should take. Here are three strategies that we could have used to avoid this horrible mess. First, mitigate failure by adding redundancy. We could provide alternative communication paths through the system to the database or clustered versions of the database and failover mechanisms to reach those alternative sources of data or any combination of these. Second, we could cache copies of the data at various strategic points through the system. And last, we could mitigate the impact of the failure by reducing the number of ways that things could go wrong. For example, we could simplify the communication path by reducing the distance between the data and its point of use. In general, it's true that a wide area network is more likely to lose connectivity than a local area network, and a local area network is more risky than co-located data. So in the eGate example, we could imagine combining strategies two and three, so that each eGate holds its own copy of the list of people who aren't allowed in. A bad person cache, if you like. So now, during the normal operation of the system, that is, allowing people into the country, there is no requirement for the network connection to be present at all. At the end of this video, I'll point out some concerning questions that I think really need to be asked about the general response to this eGate failure. But for now, why is this failure relevant to you? Well, no matter what kind of distributed system you're working on, if you assume that everything has to be working for it to be useful, you're doing it wrong. Always assume that things will break and think about where and how to keep the system making progress even as failures are happening around you, as far as you're able to anyway. For the eGate system, these problems are not eliminated, only deferred by my proposed solution. But that means that this new design will fail more gracefully than is designed with a single point of failure. It's much more resilient as a result. We can wait longer for us to fit, identify and fix the real cause of the problem. Each e-gate would be, then be capable of working based on its own bad person cache. Even when a failure that we can't imagine or predict happens elsewhere. Resilient systems aren't resilient because they always work perfectly. They're resilient because each part of the system can make progress in the absence of other parts. Even when they may be currently in the middle of failing or missing altogether. So what would we lose with this more resilient, more distributed design? There's always a trade-off after all. Well, consistency. Now, each e-gate has its own copy of the list of bad people. We can't guarantee that every gate has precisely the same list. This design is based on the idea of eventual consistency. At any given moment, we can't know that everything is perfectly in step but we can design a system like this to be sure that it will become consistent later on. And that's not quite as scary as it sounds, because when everything is working perfectly, any difference between one e-gate and another will probably be measured in milliseconds. Also, even the existing system can't guarantee that all e-gates are, are actually in step because of race conditions and late the latency of communications. This is a complex problem. In a more resilient version of this system, we could imagine the central server that maintains the list of bad people issuing an event. Whenever someone is added or removed from the list, each eGate uses these events to maintain its own local copy. This is a pretty common distributed log strategy and pretty well understood. We could do this for each eGate as I described, or maybe for each airport where the airport keeps its own bad person cache, shortening the path and so reducing and exposing the, the points of failure as I described earlier. One of my teams once did the equivalent of this for a distributed point of sale system with over 10,000 stores. So now we're reducing the number of places where errors can stop things working by moving the data closer to the point of use. I'd probably prefer, if I'm honest, to store the data in, at the e-gate if we could. At most, I'd assume that there are probably only a few million records to keep in the bad person list. Pretty light work for a database these days. I can imagine people in the home office saying that the requirements make it more complex than this, and I'm sure that they're right. 
I'm sure that it's important, for example, that no single bad person must be allowed in as far as is practicable. But I'd be interested to know how the manual border control solution worked in reality in the emergency response. The press say that the passport control officers use their laptops to verify people. So how did that work? Was that based on laptops using an alternative route to the database of bad people? Or was it based on them communicating with an alternate copy, maybe a more local copy of the bad person list? In which case, if it was the first of these, why isn't the eGate system designed to use that alternative communication route in the event of a system failure, instead of relying on people to do it manually? And if it's the second case of there being a copy of the bad people list somewhere else, then this is only the same as my preferred automated distributed solution to this problem. Except that treating this as an eventual consistency and caching problem means that things will be out of step for much less time and at the point of failure would need no manual intervention to keep the system working, at least temporarily until the cause of the failure is identified and fixed. My assumption is that this system was probably designed by somebody with a traditional database focus of there being a single source of truth somewhere rather than as a genuinely more robust distributed system. Give someone a hammer and all problems look like nails. <laughs> so when John Atkinson said this, the reason that I disagree with that too is that this isn't magic or impossible. We know how to do these things, to design or at least to mitigate those risks and often to prevent them from being catastrophic altogether. This isn't about the need for perfect foresight or perfect systems or even better tools. That's just an easy thing to say, to be honest. The real answer is better design. We need to assume that stuff will go wrong, then work to limit the blast radius when it does. And we need to experiment using techniques like chaos engineering to help us to identify new ways that we haven't yet thought of that things will go wrong. As engineers, it's never enough to only imagine the happy path. Our job instead is to always be thinking, yes, but what happens if Thank you for watching. And if you enjoy our stuff here on the Continuous Delivery Channel, do consider supporting us by joining our Patreon community. As ever, thanks to our Patreons for your ongoing support. There's lots of advantages to joining the community, not least the fantastic active discussion board on Discord. Thank you and see you next week.